<clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dr. Nirav Padlia. Uh, I'm Vice President of Research and Development at Myos Rens Technology, based in uh, Cedar Knolls, New Jersey. Uh, I'm delighted to be joining you this afternoon uh, for our webinar, which is titled Muscle Health Matters for Small Animals, Improving Longevity and Quality of Life. So I've, I've organized this webinar into two components. Uh, during the first component of the webinar, I'm going to give you a broad overview of the field of uh, muscle health. And I'm going to talk about some very, uh, some very important studies that have been done in the area of muscle health and longevity. Uh, I'm going to talk about two important studies that have been done uh, in, in humans, two important human clinical trials. And uh, although I, I understand that all of you are veterinarians, but the reason I'm going to talk about these studies is they're, they're very large studies, excellent quality studies. And then I'm going to talk about some important veterinary clinical trials that have been done to examine the impact of muscle health and, uh, and quality of life uh, and longevity. Then I'm going to shift gears a bit. And from there, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about our proprietary product at Myos Rens Technology, which is called Fortitropin. And I'm going to talk about research that we have sponsored uh, uh, at Myos on Fortitropin, both uh, veterinary research and human uh, research related to Fortitropin. So the first question is, why does muscle health matter? And uh, you know, this is a great, this is a great question. And uh, Professor Lisa Freeman at, uh, at Tufts University, she recently published an article in this area. And uh, this was a quote that I, that, that I found very interesting in that article. She wrote that although weight and muscle loss have been recognized in companion animals for many years, only recently have they, have they become acknowledged as a common and detrimental finding. And so I would say that the number one reason why uh, muscle health matters uh, you know, to, to humans and to animals is, is longevity. And so I'm going to talk about uh, in some detail about these two human studies that were done. One was at the Karolinska Institute in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. The other was at uh, Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital on uh, muscle mass and its impact on breast cancer survival. Then I'm going to get into some veterinary studies with you. I'm going to talk about the study from uh, ENVA in France that looked at the impact of dog frailty and, and on mortality. And I'm going to talk about this study from Tufts University uh, School of Veterinary Medicine that looked at uh, body condition score and its impact on dogs with heart failure. Uh, so an, another important reason why, uh, why muscle health matters so much has to do with quality of life. You know, if muscle, muscle health is severely impacted in, in, in an animal, then it makes it very difficult, for example, for, for a dog to, you know, to, to go for a walk, to, to fetch a stick, you know, to catch a ball, to, to do all of those things that dogs enjoy doing with their owners, right? Uh, another area, <clears throat> Another reason why muscle health is so important, an area which is underappreciated, it has to do with the impact that muscle health has on bone health. And so <clears throat> I would, uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about this area, I would very much encourage you to read this publication uh, by Hamrick uh, in Bone Key Reports. And this talks about uh, biochemical signaling and biochemical crosstalk between muscle and bone. So muscle, for example, uh, synthesizes uh, cytokines and growth factors that are very important for bone health. Some of these include uh, fibroblast growth factor two, for example, along with osteonectin. And that's discussed in detail in, in this paper that I've cited. Uh, another key uh, important reason has to do with muscle bone and biomechanical interactions between muscle and bone. So muscle, for example, exerts mechanical loading forces against bone, and those mechanical loading forces are very important for bone to maintain their, their shape, their form, and their density. And so naturally, when, when, when muscle tissue, when, when muscle mass is compromised, when, when muscle tissue is reduced, then there are fewer of those uh, bi biomechanical interactions that can take place. Th those loading forces become much weaker. 
Another area uh, has to do with energy metabolism. So, you know, we all know that muscle is the primary glucose metabolizing engine of the body. And so it makes sense to us intuitively that, you know, if muscle mass is compromised, if we lose muscle mass, or if our, if our pets that we care for lose muscle mass, then that, that engine which metabolizes glucose in our, in our bodies you know, becomes uh, severely compromised. And so uh, a natural consequence of that would be elevated blood sugar levels. And, uh, and so this paper by Landy et al., uh, although it's a, a human study, talks about how reduced muscle mass is correlated with elevated risk for type 2 diabetes. Now I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, diagnosis of sarcopenia and cachexia. So the, uh, the human diagnosis of cachexia uh, focuses primarily on unintended weight loss. Okay, so weight loss that is greater than 5% in, in 12 months uh, is, is very important when it comes to diagnosing uh, cachexia. And, and so I, I guess I should rewind a bit and, and talk about the difference between sarcopenia and cachexia. I, I realize I forgot to do that. So both sarcopenia and cachexia involve muscle loss, but they're both very different. You know, sarcopenia is, is about age-related muscle loss, and it happens over a long period of time, and the muscle loss that is observed in sarcopenia is very gradual and, and happens over a long period of time. Cachexia almost always uh, is associated with some underlying illness. Uh, for example, there is cancer-related cachexia, there is chronic kidney disease-related cachexia, there is AIDS-related cachexia, for example. The muscle loss that happens in cachexia is far more severe, both in humans and in animals, than the muscle loss that's observed in sarcopenia. So in humans, when we, when we talk about cachexia, in addition to the unintended weight loss that is observed, there, there is always, almost, almost always one other component. And, and that other component uh, is typically decreased muscle strength, fatigue, uh, anorexia, low fat-free mass index, and abnormal biochemistry. And so that abnormal biochemistry often includes uh, upregulation of uh, inflammatory markers, you know, inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6, uh, TNF-alpha, um, CRP are, are, are typical in the case of human cachexia, okay? In the case of veterinary medicine, the diagnosis of sarcopenia and cachexia is a bit different. It focuses more so on muscle loss and, and not so much on weight loss. And, uh, you know, inflammatory markers for cats and dogs, as you will appreciate as veterinarians, are not routinely measured. Assessing muscle strength is difficult, okay, because grip strength, as you know, is not possible uh, with, with small animals like cats and dogs. However, a six-minute walk test, though, which is commonly done in humans, has also been reported in, uh, in small animals, and I'm going to talk about that in, in my slides. And uh, a score known as the muscle condition score is very important for the diagnosis of, uh, of, of sarcopenia and cachexia in small animals. So uh, the, the World uh, Society on, uh, uh, of Small Animal, uh, of small animal uh, vet Veterinary Nutrition has published this, uh, this guideline on, on assessing the muscle condition score. And uh, as you can see here in the, in the case of this dog, and unfortunately this dog is very sick. Uh, it's suffering cardiac cachexia uh, due to uh, congestive heart failure. And it looks like, you know, based on this chart by uh, WSAVA, it looks like this dog uh, probably would fall in the, the severe muscle loss category. As I had mentioned earlier, you know, six minute walk test in dogs uh, has, been, uh, has been performed and has been reported in the literature. So this is a study uh, that, that looked at uh, the six minute walk test. A comparison was, uh, was conducted looking at 69 healthy dogs and six affected dogs. And you, you know, you'll notice over here that the healthy dogs were able to walk 522 meters uh, approximately over the course of six minutes, 
while uh, dogs that were affected, they were, they were able to walk only 384 meters, probably about 40% less the distance during the same, uh, the same period of time, six minutes. And uh, th this was published in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine in 2011. So the first uh, clinical study that I want to talk about is a human clinical study. It was conducted at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. But uh, the study was also done in collaboration with uh, University of North Texas and the University of South Carolina. And the purpose of this study was to look at the, to, to examine the association between muscular strength and mortality from all causes, uh, including cardiovascular disease and, and cancer in men. So it was focused only on men. I like to talk about this study a lot, actually, because it was a very large study. It was a prospective cohort study involving 8,762 men that were between the ages of 20 to 80 years of age. Uh, the study was done at an aerobics uh, center uh, at Cooper Clinic in Dallas, Texas. And the, uh, the, the follow-up period was very long, uh, which is another reason why I like the study a lot. You know, the average follow-up period here was 18.9 years. In terms of outcome measures, there were, there were two key outcome measures. One of them was all-cause mortality up to the 31st of December of 2003. And the other outcome measure was muscular strength. And that was measured by a one repetition maximal measure for, for the leg press and, and for bench press as well. Okay, so I, I know that there is a lot of data displayed on this slide. <clears throat> but I would like you very much to just focus your attention on the area that I've highlighted in the red box. Okay, and if we, if we look at uh, the area in, in this red box, you know, first I'd like you to focus your attention on all-cause mortality and the rate of all-cause mortality. And let's look at, uh, uh, let's compare uh, all-cause mortality in men that were in the lower third of muscular strength with, with men that were in the middle and upper thirds of muscular strength. And you can see that for men that were in the lowest one third of muscular strength, their mortality rate was approximately 50% higher than men which were in the, the upper and middle one thirds. At, uh, you, know, you can see that this mortality rate was about 38.9 per 10,000 person years when compared to about 26 for the middle and upper thirds. Now let's look at uh, mortality rates due to cardiovascular disease. And here you'll notice that it was about 50% higher, not 50%, 100% higher. So men that were in the lower uh, one third of muscular strength were, were twice as likely to die of cardiovascular disease when compared with their peers that were in the upper and middle thirds. And then again, if we look at uh, mortality due to cancer, we can see that uh, men in the lower one third, they had roughly about a, a mortality rate that was about 50% higher due to cancer that met, uh, when compared with men that were in the middle in upper thirds in terms of uh, mortality rates. And so the take home message is that men in the lower third of muscular strength had significantly increased rates of mortality from all causes, from cardiovascular disease and cancer, when compared with their peers that were in the middle and upper uh, thirds in terms of muscular strength. So that study that I just talked about was, was a study that, that involved men, exclusively men. So now I'm going to talk about a, a study that, that involves women because, uh, you know, to, to, to De demonstrate that women are just as much impacted by muscle mass and, and muscle strength as, as men are. And so this was a study that was published at, uh, the work was done at Harvard Medical School and at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. It looked at women that were diagnosed with non-metastatic breast cancer. And uh, the researcher sought to ask the question, are sarcopenia, poor muscle quality, and excess adiposity at diagnosis associated with overall mortality in patients with non-metastatic breast cancer? 
So this was, an, this was also a very large study like the Karolinska study. It was an observational study involving 3,241 uh, women diagnosed with non-metastatic breast cancer uh, from January of 2000 to December of 2013. Okay, and at the time of uh, breast cancer diagnosis, CT was performed and uh, the researchers looked at, they, they looked at the CT results to, to categorize the women, to look to see if they had sarcopenia, which is low muscle mass, poor muscle quality, uh, which is examined uh, by, by looking at low muscle radio density or excess adiposity. And so the, my, the main outcome measures from this study were overall survival time and also all-cause mortality. Uh, like, like the case in the Karolinska study that I talked about earlier, you know, I, I realize there is a lot of data here, but for the time being, I'd like you to focus only on the region that I've highlighted in red, in this red box. And I'd like you to focus here on women that were non-sarcopenic and had low total adipose tissue, TAT. And now I'd like you to focus on this area, which are, there, which are women also with low total adipose tissue, but women that were sarcopenic. And if we compare non-sarcopenic counterparts with their sarcopenic counterparts, we, we see that the hazard ratio increased from one to 1.35 in these women. And now if we focus on our attention on non-sarcopenic women who are in the, the mid range in terms of total adipose tissue uh, with a hazard ratio of 1.28, we can see that that 1.28 hazard ratio increases to 1.83 when we look at women that are sarcopenic and, and in the middle in terms of total adipose tissue. Now if we, <clears throat> If we look at the women which were non-sarcopenic and had high total adipose tissue, so their hazard ratio is 1.45, and that increases from 1.45 to 2.05 in women when we go from women that were non-sarcopenic with high total adipose tissue to women that were sarcopenic and also had high total adipose tissue. And if we shift our attention over here, to this Kaplan-Meier plot, we can see that, you know, women that were not sarcopenic had overall a much higher uh, life expectancy, were, were much more likely to survive after being diagnosed with non-metastatic breast cancer when compared with their peers who, who were sarcopenic, as this Kaplan-Meier plot shows uh, here on the right. So now I want to talk a little bit about the frailty related phenotype in dogs. And, uh, and, and so the, the, the frailty related phenotype, which is described in detail in the, this publication in the American Journal of Veterinary Research has five components. Okay, and these components are, you know, the first component is chronic undernutrition. And chronic undernutrition could be, as a result, could be due to a number of reasons. You know, it, it could be due to uh, dental reasons, for example, or it, it could be due to, you know, reasons such as uh, GI-related issues, for example. Uh, exhaustion is another, is an important component of FRP, and typically this is self-reported by, by the dog owner. Uh, low physical activity level, you know, fortunately in this, this day and age, this can be easily quantified with devices like the Vetrax device or other you know, pedometers uh, that keep track of a number of steps that a dog can take during, during a given day. Poor mobility, and so poor mobility could be due to a variety of reasons. You know, for, example, uh, for example, if a dog has had a tear of the uh, cranial cruciate ligament and if it hasn't been corrected by surgery, then naturally that is going to result in poor mobility. And, and weakness is typically, this is typically subjective. This is, in, in, in most cases, is, is reported by the, the, the dog owner, you know, based on a, a subjective assessment of the, the dog's uh, behavior, typically. So now I want to talk uh, a little bit about this study 
uh, so a very good study that was done that looked at the impact of dog frailty and longevity. And this was conducted at the, uh, the National School of uh, Veterinary Medicine in, at uh, Alfort in Alfort, France. And it looked at uh, frailty related phenotype and mortality in dogs. And so the purpose of the study was to examine the association between a, a, the, the five components of FRP, which I just described in detail in mortality in dogs. And so the researchers, they compared dogs that had one out of the five FRP components with dogs that had two or more FRP components in terms of survival time uh, after the dogs had underwent a clini clinical geriatric assessment. So in this study, there were 116 uh, aged neutered guide dogs uh, that were followed after they had underwent a CGA. 58 of these dogs were males and 58 of these dogs were females. And the dogs, uh, were some of them were golden retrievers, some of them were Labrador retrievers, and there were a number of dogs that were golden retriever, Labrador retriever crossbreeds. They were born between uh, January 1st of 1995 to December 31st of 2002. And these were all dogs that were obtained from the Parisian School of Guide Dogs for blind or visually impaired people. And the primary outcome measure in the study was the time from CGA to death. So th this table uh, provides an overview of, all, of uh, the baseline char characteristics of these 116 dogs. You, could, you can look up this, this reference and, and, and examine it closely in, in detail. And, uh, but the most important uh, thing that I'd like to focus on is this Kaplan-Meier plot. And so the solid line in the Kaplan-Meier plot represents dogs that had only one uh, FRP component uh, out, out of the five components that we had talked about earlier. The dashed line over here represents dogs that had two or more of the FRP components. And you can see that the, the survival time for dogs with, with only one component versus two or more components is vastly different. Okay? Just completely night and day difference, uh, as you can see from this Kaplan-Meier plot. So, uh, the other study that I want to talk about, veterinary study that I'd like to talk about, was a study that was conducted at Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine. And this was a study that examined the impact of body condition on heart, heart failure survival in dogs. So the researchers sought to gain insight into the question does body condition and changes in body weight predict the survival of dogs with heart failure? And so this dog involved, or sorry, this study involved 108 dogs. Their medical records were reviewed and data regarding initial body weight and body condition score, uh, along with uh, subsequent changes in body weight and treatment were collected by the researchers. And the key outcome measures here, again, were survival times that were determined for the dogs after they were discharged from the hospital uh, and, and lived for greater than 24 hours. And this study was published in, uh, in Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine back in 2008. So as you can see from, from this Kaplan-Meier plot, the dogs that, that did the most poorly in terms of survival were the emaciated dogs, the dogs that were severely, severely underweight. Now, you would think intuitively that, that dogs that, that were obese would have also done very, very poorly as well. But actually, we, we found that dogs that were, that were overweight and obese were, still did much, much better than dogs that were emaciated uh, when, when, when looking at body condition score and survival uh, in dogs with heart failure. And so, uh, the authors, they talked about something known as the obesity paradox, which is an important phenomenon in, in cardiology. And I found this sentence uh, very interesting that the, the, the researchers wrote uh, as to, you know, one possible explanation with, with regards to why overweight and obese dogs didn't, did, did actually fairly well compared to the emaciated dogs. Uh, may be a, a cardioprotective role of adipose tissue-derived neuroendocrine molecules 
including cytokines and hormones. So now uh, I've completed the first component of the webinar, which was focused on giving you a broad overview of the field of, of how muscle health impacts longevity and quality of life. And now I'm going to shift gears a bit here and talk about our proprietary product at, at Myos, which is a product called Fortitropin. And I'm going to talk now for the remainder of the webinar about research that we have sponsored at Myos Rens Technology related to Fortitropin. So what is Fortitropin? Fortitropin is a natural bioactive composition that is made from fertilized chicken egg yolk. The, the product is manufactured using patented low temperature technology. <clears throat> Our company uh, has two issued US patents related to the manufacturing process of Fortitropin. And this process was developed by researchers at the German Institute of Food Technologies also known as DIL, which is based in Quackenbrook, Germany. And the manufacturing process helps to retain the natural bioactivity bioact of the proteins, lipids, and, and peptides that are found to, to be naturally present in fertilized, uh, and the key thing is fertilized chicken egg yolk. Research, both veterinary research and human cl clinical research has shown that fortitropin helps to increase muscle mass and strength and the product is manufactured in modern state-of-the-art GMP facilities. So I want to talk very briefly about this because you know, when, when, whenever we talk with, uh, with researchers uh, and, and veterinarians and physicians, they always ask us about egg intake and the impact of eggs on CVD risk and mortality. And so this is a study that was published uh, about six weeks ago in the, journal of the, uh, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And this is probably one of the largest studies that has been published to date that examined the impact of, uh, of eggs and uh, dietary consumption of eggs on blood lipid profile, on uh, cardiovascular disease and, and mortality. This study involved 177,000 patients in 50 different countries and the authors concluded that we did not find significant associations between egg intake and blood lipids mortality or major CVD events. And uh, the, the, the reference to the study is given here. So we have two products for the, uh, for the veterinary market. Uh, our, our, our products are Myos Canine Muscle Formula and My Myos Canine Muscle Formula Vet Strength. Okay, so Myos Canine Muscle Formula is a product that is comprised of one simple ingredient, and that is fortitropin. And the product is available direct to consumer and through, uh, through various e-commerce partners. We also have a Myos Canine Muscle Formula Vet Strength product. <clears throat> this product is, ex is available exclusively through veterinarians. And it's comprised of three ingredients rather than just one ingredient. There is fortitropin, but the product is also supplemented with branched chain amino acids. You know, there is a very large body of literature about uh, the impact of BCAAs on, uh, on muscle protein synthesis and muscle gain. But BCAAs are very bitter in taste, and so there is some dextrose that is added to the Myos K9 muscle formula, that strength product, to help sweeten the the product a bit to get rid of some of that bitter taste from the BCAAs. And both of these products, the, the, the regular Myos K9 muscle formula and the VET strength product are, are manufactured in modern state-of-the-art GMP facilities. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the research behind Fortitropin. So there is uh, extensive human clinical research and animal research behind Fortitropin. So the first study I wanna talk about is a human clinical trial that was conducted at University of California at Berkeley. This study was conducted by Professor Bill Evans, who is a key opinion leader in the field of muscle physiology. He has about uh, 200 plus publications to his credit in peer reviewed journals. And the, the results are going to be presented next week at the International Conference on Frailty and Sarcopenia Research in Toulouse, France. And so in this study, in 60 to 75 year old men and women, it was demonstrated that fortitropin increased the rate of muscle protein synthesis by about 
So next is a study uh, that we published in, that, that was published in 2016 and, uh, by researchers at the University of Tampa. This was a study that looked at the impact of fortitropin on muscle size, mass, and strength in 18 to 20, uh, 21-year-old men and women. And this was published in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition back in 2016. We also have a study that is underway at McMaster University, which is looking at the impact of fortitropin on, on muscle atrophy related to, to disuse, muscle disuse atrophy. Uh, in terms of animal research, I'm going to talk in detail about this study that was done at Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine, where we looked at the impact of fortitropin on dogs undergoing TPLO surgery. Uh, you know, uh, being veterinarians, all of you know that TPLO surgery is performed to repair tears of the cranial cruciate ligament. And this paper has been submitted for publication to PLOS One. The, the revision has currently been submitted and hopefully it will appear in print within the next uh, two to three months. <clears throat> now, this study that was done at University of Tampa, it also had an animal component to it as well. Uh, an animal study in rodents was done to, to elucidate the mechanism of action. And it was found that fortitropin acts by upregulating the mTOR pathway, by downregulating the ubiquitin proteasome pathway, and by lowering myostatin levels and, and also expression of ACTR2B, uh, which is the receptor for myostatin. My, myostatin is a very important protein when it comes to muscle. It's a protein that, that essentially puts the brakes on the growth and development of new muscle tissue. And as a result, there are a number of pharmaceutical companies that are working on targeting myostatin, primarily using monoclonal antibodies. We also have a second study that is currently underway at Kansas State University, also in the laboratory of Professor Ken Harkin. And that study is looking at the impact of fortitropin on quality of life and mobility in geriatric dogs. So uh, th this is the, the study that I had talked about earlier. Uh, as veterinarians, as I had mentioned, all of you know that tibial plateau leveling osteotomy surgery is performed to repair tears of the cranial cruciate ligament, which serves a function that is analogous to that of the anterior, uh, the, the anterior uh, <clears throat> cruciate ligament in, in humans, the ACL. And so the, the operated limb must be immobilized for several weeks after surgery, and that typically results in significant muscle loss. So in this uh, clinical study, there were, there were 100 dogs in total Okay, 50 of these dogs received fortitropin on a daily basis, and 50 dogs received a macronutrient matched placebo, which in this case was cheese powder. And a number of evaluations were, were performed at T equals zero, eight, and 12 weeks following surgery. These evaluations were comprised of thigh circumference, muscle thickness, stance analysis, and blood chemistry. And I'm going to talk about the research, uh, about the results, sorry, in detail in the next few slides, but the key uh, conclusions from this study were that fortitropin prevented muscle loss in both uh, affected and unaffected limbs in these dogs. Fortitropin supplemented dogs had, had greater improvement in weight bearing capacity on their operated limb, and fortitropin supplementation prevented a rise in levels of myostatin, which I just talked about earlier. Uh, that being that myostatin is a key protein that, that puts the brakes on muscle growth and development. So uh, this, this, this table, I understand that this table is pretty, it, it seems rather complicated at first, but it's actually, it, it's very simple. So you, you have a dog you know, uh, which stands on a force plate uh, device, and so the force plate has four quadrants, one quadrant for each of the, the dog's four legs. And measurements were taken at, uh, three, three measurements were taken, one at uh, baseline, one after eight weeks and after 12 weeks. And here we're looking at force plate measurements and fortitropin supplemented dogs versus dogs that, that received the placebo. <clears throat> so, after a dog has undergone surgery, you can appreciate that the dog is not going to be able to put very much weight at all on the operated limb. 
And so most of the dog's weight is going to be distributed on its remaining three limbs. And so that is, that, that is why here in this case, you know, you have about 33% of the weight being distributed on one limb as opposed to 25%, you know, which, which would be closer to what you would expect in a healthy dog. So the quadrant, which is, uh, which is highlighted in light blue, is the quadrant that corresponds to the operated limb, the, the dog's operated limb. And if we take a look here at the fortitropin supplemented dog, we see that going from uh, time equals zero to time equals eight weeks, there's a significant improvement when it comes to uh, weight bearing capacity. We go from 8% to 13.74%, so an improvement of 5.74%. But if we look at the dogs that received the placebo, the improvement was much smaller. Here we go from 9.63% to 12.88%, so that corresponds to an improvement of 3.25% versus an improvement of 5.74%, which we saw in the case of dogs that were supplemented with fortitropin. So now we take a look at thigh circumference in both fortitropin supplemented dogs and dogs that receive placebo. So if we look at the dogs that were, were unaffected, for example, and also affected dogs, if we take a look over here, we see that the affected dogs uh, going from uh, zero to eight weeks, they experienced a drop of about 0.54 centimeters in thigh circumference in the, in the fortitropin supplemented dogs, okay? But that is much lower when we look at the placebo. When we look at dogs that are in the placebo group, they experienced a drop of about 1.21 uh, centimeters in, in comparison to about uh, only 0.54 centimeters. So it's about, you know, more than, more than double the, the reduction in thigh circumference in placebo supplemented dogs relative to fortitropin supplemented dogs in, in this case. And the other area where I want to draw your attention to is our, our changes in serum myostatin levels within each group. Okay, so when we look at the fortitropin supplemented dogs, uh, the mean increase in myostatin, and, and keep in mind that increase in myostatin is a bad thing because myostatin puts the brakes on the development of, of new muscle tissue. The mean increase in myostatin was quite small. It was 45.1 picograms per ml per week, which was not statistically significant. The p-value was 0 0.66. But when we compare that with dogs that receive placebo, you can see that the mean increase was much higher. It was 358.9 picograms per ml per week. And the p-value was statistically significant at 0 0.02. So now I want to talk a little bit about the human clinical trial that we conducted at uh, University of California at, at Berkeley. And the purpose of this study was to examine the impact of fortitropin on the rate of muscle protein synthesis after 21 days of intervention, either by, uh, by, by fortitropin or by placebo. And so there were 20 subjects that participated in the study. They were all between 60 to 75 years of age. 10 of the subjects were, were men and 10 of them were women, so five and five in each group. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled human clinical study where we had 10 subjects, five men, five women that received fortitropin and five men, five women that received the cheese powder placebo. So all of these subjects in the clinical study, they consumed a uh, deuterium oxide tracer uh, over the duration of the study, which was 21 days. And so the reason why deuterium oxide was used is it, it, it's an excellent tracer. You know, subjects have to consume heavy water every day. And some of that deuterium uh, oxide is eventually incorporated into all of the amino acids in the body and eventually some deuterium uh, oxide gets or some of the deuterons get incorporated into all of the proteins that are synthesized in the body and in, including all of the muscle proteins and so when one performs a muscle protein biopsy uh, a muscle tissue biopsy using high resolution mass spectrometry one can measure uh, levels of deuterium 
in, in subjects that receive the placebo and in subjects that receive fortitropin. And so elevated levels of D2O uh, indicate that, that there was elevated uh, muscle protein synthesis. And so that, 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 that is the rationale of how, how the workflow works. And so the key conclusions from the study were that the subjects that uh, received fortitropin supplementation for 21 days, they experienced an increase of approximately 15% in muscle protein synthesis when compared with subjects that received the, the cheese powder placebo. <clears throat> the, the other human clinical trial that we, we conducted, uh, it was published in 2016 in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition. And this was done at the University of Tampa. It was a 12 week uh, double blind placebo controlled randomized human clinical study in 18 to 21 year old men. These men were required to work very closely with a dietitian to control their, their diet. And uh, all of the men in this study, they had to perform uh, supervised resistance training twice per week. So there were 45 males that participated in total. They were divided into three arms. Okay, uh, three, one of the arms, uh, 15 men received a placebo, which again was cheese powder. 15 men received a single dose of fortitropin, 6.6 grams per day. And 15 of the men received a, a triple dose of fortitropin, 19.8 grams per day. And the primary endpoints here were skeletal muscle uh, hypertrophy and lean body mass. And as you can see in the men, uh, when we look at lean body mass and muscle thickness, the men in the placebo groups, they did not experience statistically significant increases in lean body mass and muscle thickness going from uh, time equals zero to 12 weeks. But we did see significant increases in uh, lean body mass and muscle thickness in both of the two fortitropin groups, the, the 1x dose and the 3x dose. And finally, I'd like to talk about this study, uh, which is currently underway uh, at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, just outside of Toronto. This study is looking at the impact of fortitropin on muscle disuse atrophy. And so the model that is being used in this study is, is known as the unilateral leg immobilization model. It's a very well studied model. You'll find a number of publications on this model if you look at the peer reviewed literature. And essentially the model involves wearing a cast or a knee brace on a single leg for two weeks. And the act of wearing that cast induces muscle atrophy in a way that is very, that, that is very reproducible, that has been studied very well and described very well in the literature. And so the key question is, does fortitropin reduce muscle disuse atrophy relative to placebo? And this study, again, is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled human clinical trial with two parallel groups. There are 12 men that are going to receive a cheese powder placebo and 12 men that will receive fortitropin. They, they are all young male subjects. And so the first phase of the study, the initial two-week phase of the study is the run-in phase, where subjects will take their assigned supplement, either fortitropin or cheese powder, for two weeks. And then after two weeks of, of consuming their assigned supplement, uh, all of the subjects will undergo immobilization. They'll wear their cast for two weeks, their, their knee brace, and that's going to induce muscle atrophy. And then following that two-week uh, that, that two period of immobilization, there is a two-week recovery period going from week four to week six, where the subjects will continue to uh, consume their assigned supplement after removing their cast. And as you can see, there, there are a number of measurements that will, will take place, including four muscle microbiopsies that will be performed during the course of the study, uh, along with DEXA and, and myostatin, ultrasound, accelerometry, uh, and strength measurements. The study, the, the principal investigator of the study is Professor Stuart Phillips. Like Professor Evans, he is a key opinion leader in the field of muscle physiology with approximately 225 uh, peer-reviewed publications to his credit. And patient recruitment is currently underway. The, the study was initiated in January of 2020. So I'd just like to summarize all of the veterinary research that uh, we have conducted at, at Myos Rens Technology. 
Uh, we, we completed a clinical study on the impact of fortitropin on recovery in dogs following TPLO surgery. The principal investigator was Professor Ken Harkin at Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, the study has been completed and uh, a manuscript has been submitted to PLOS One for publication. We expect publication to happen within the next two to three months. We also have another uh, clinical study that is underway in the laboratory of Professor Harkin. Uh, that is looking at the impact of fortitropin on quality of life and mobility in geriatric dogs. And that study is still currently underway, also at K-State. And the third study that we have underway is at the Animal Medical Center in, in New York. And that study is uh, it's being conducted by Professor Leilani Alvarez. And she is looking at the impact of fortitropin on serum myostatin levels over the course of 24 hours. So I, I'd just like to summarize here that uh, you know, fortitropin is, a, is an all natural, highly safe nutrition product that helps to promote muscle health in dogs. In veterinary clinical trials, we have shown that fortitropin has been shown to reduce muscle atrophy improve recovery and maintain st stable levels of myostatin in dogs following TPLO surgery. And finally, gaining muscle mass will enable dogs to enjoy uh, an active and, and healthy and enjoyable lifestyle. And the most important takeaway that I'd like to leave you with is that extensive clinical research, both in humans and dogs, has shown the relationship between muscle health and longevity. If you have any questions, uh, if your questions are of a scientific or technical nature, feel free to email me at uh, npadlia at myoscorp.com. And if you have any questions related to business development opportunities, related to, to sales or partnership uh, opportunities, I, I would encourage you to reach out to Andrea Libretti. She is our Director of Business Development. She can be reached at alibretti at myoscorp.com. Uh, I thank you once again. Th thank you very much for joining me for our webinar this afternoon, and I hope you have a great day. Take care.